Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our risen and victorious Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. How does prayer work? Prayer, I think, is probably one of the things, if we're honest, that we take most for granted among the gifts that are given to the Christian. But how often have you thought about deeply what prayer actually is? I alluded to this when I was talking to the children. Who are you speaking with when you pray? No one other than the God of all things, the creator of the universe. Maybe a good way to imagine what that's like, although this isn't even really coming close, but imagine if you were granted audience with the Queen of England. It's quite a process. You have to wear certain clothes. They teach you how to properly greet, greet the Queen. It's a big deal. So how big a deal do you think it is to be allowed into the throne room of the King of all creation and speak freely? It's a huge gift that Jesus has given us. It is nothing short of a miracle. And we'll get into today the process that we had to undergo in order to be in the mere presence of God in the Old Testament compared to the relationship we have now because of our risen and victorious Savior, Jesus. It is sinful creatures able to converse and even make requests of the King of the universe. That is what prayer is. But how did we get to a place where this is even possible? How do we get to a place where we're allowed to come into God's throne room? And once we're there, how exactly does this prayer thing actually work? And is it a good thing for us to do? Should we do it? In our gospel text today, Jesus answers all of these questions about prayer. So first question, how is this even possible? How is it even possible? Well, this is where our section of verses starts. Jesus says, in that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. There's a lot to unpack in this one verse, but the first thing to note is the verbs. The disciples, who do you think they've been asking for guidance and assistance the last three years? Not their heavenly Father. No, in the Old Testament, you couldn't even say the name of God. It was that holy. But the disciples have been asking Jesus for guidance and assistance, but now something big is happening. A change is about to occur. Right? In that day, you'll ask nothing of me, Jesus says. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, you will, He will give it to you. Now the disciples, in that day, will be able to speak to the Father directly. When I really thought about that, it blew me away. I mean, think of how many times you say, Dear God, Heavenly Father, Almighty God, Merciful Father, without even thinking. It wasn't always so. Something big and important had to happen before this shift could occur. And here it is, Jesus describing it. See, in the Old Testament, how did God speak with His people? He didn't converse directly with them as we do now. He spoke with them through his prophets. That was the one person that he would reveal himself to, share his words with, and then he would direct the prophet to go and tell the people, thus says Yahweh, thus says the Lord. So what's changed? What's changed is in that day. That's the key. Jesus is referring to his death and his resurrection. 
Remember, right now it hasn't happened yet. We're, we're in the chapter right before the high priestly prayer, right before the passion kicks off in the garden, ends at the cross, and comes back in joy with the empty tomb. And just as last week, Jesus, we're still in the section where Jesus is preparing His disciples for this time where He will not be with them. This time that He knows they don't yet fully understand what God's plan is here, and when He dies on the cross, they will despair. And He gets into that a little later. But first, how does Jesus' resurrection really change the game on prayer? What difference does it make? Well, as I shared with the kids, when Jesus dies, something happens in the temple. The curtain that separated the rest of the temple from the Holy of Holies, the dwelling place of God among His people is torn asunder, and it specifically says in the text, from top to bottom wasn't a cohort of Pharisees that tore it down. It was God Himself tearing down that barrier. The barrier between God's sinful people and Himself. And before you start to feel slighted that God was hiding from you, that barrier was for our own good. For us sinful and unclean people cannot survive in the presence of God of our holy God. So when Jesus pays the price for all of that sin, that barrier that separates from us, His blood washes it all away, and that barrier is no more. Now, when we read the curtain image from the temple, it reminds us of the Old Testament, because Jesus is establishing something new. So I'm going to read a portion of the chapter 16 in Leviticus, if you want to follow along in your Bible that's in the pew, it's on page 89, and he's talking about the Day of Atonement. And here in our New Testament text, our Gospel text, it starts with, in that day, and Jesus is referring to when He's going to make the perfect atonement. But until then, I'm going to share with you what the process was like for God's sinful people to have time in His presence. The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they drew near before the Lord and died. And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron your brother not to come at any time into the holy place inside the veil, before the mercy seat that is on the ark, so that he may not die. For I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. But in this way Aaron shall come into the holy place with a bull from the head from the herd for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen coat and shall have the linen undergarment on his body and he shall tie the linen sash around his waist and wear the linen turban. These are the holy garments. He shall bathe his body in water and then put them on and he shall take from the congregation of the people of Israel two male goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering for himself and shall make atonement for himself and for his house. Then he shall take the two goats and set them before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And Aaron shall cast lots over the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for Azazel. And Aaron shall present the goat on which the lot fell for the Lord and use it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell for Azazel shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement over it, that it may be sent away into the wilderness to Azazel. Aaron shall present the bull as a sin offering for himself, and shall make atonement for himself and for his house. He shall kill the bull as a sin offering for himself, and he shall take a censer full of coals of fire from the altar before the Lord, and two handfuls of sweet incense beaten small, and he shall bring it inside the veil, and put the incense on the fire before the Lord, and the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is over the testimony, so that he does not die. And he shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the front of the mercy seat on the east side, and in the front of the mercy seat he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people, and bring its blood inside the veil, and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull." Sprinkle it over the mercy seat in front of the mercy seat. Thus he shall make atonement for the holy place 
because of the uncleanness of the people of Israel and because of their transgressions, all their sins. And so he shall do for the tent of meeting, which dwells with them in the midst of their uncleanness. No one may be in the tent of meeting from the time he enters to make atonement in the holy place until he comes out and has made atonement for himself and for his house and for all the assembly of Israel. Then he shall go out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it, and shall take some of the blood of the bull and some of the blood of the goat and put it on the horns of the altar all around, and he shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and consecrate it from the uncleanness of the people of Israel. You got all that? It was a complicated process to get into the presence of God in the Old Testament. And they cite two reasons why. One is so that he may not die. And two, because of the uncleanness of the people of Israel. Because of their sins, because of their transgressions, they could not be in the presence of God. That's what is meant by the separation and the sorrow of God in the Garden of Eden. And our gospel reading begins, in that day, a new day of atonement has been set. All the promises of atonement, all the blood of those goats and bulls and the burnt offerings of the rams are no longer needed because blood is going to be shed once for all, the perfect Lamb of God. That is why you are able to say, dear Heavenly Father. But how does prayer work? So now we've established that somehow through the the gracious love of God and the miracle of Jesus, we can come into the presence of God when we enter into prayer, when we come to His table, no longer of big veils separating us because of our uncleanness, because that has been washed away in Jesus. So now what? What do we do? How does it work? Well, thankfully, my job would be very different if it wasn't the case. As you just heard, there'd be a lot of killing of animals and blood involved. Thankfully, that's no longer necessary. That elaborate ritual of washing in special clothes and the ritual sacrifice of blood is no longer necessary because Christ has made that perfect atonement for us. And so now, here's how it works. Jesus tells his disciples quite simply, ask the Father in my name and he will give it to you. (laughs) That's it? Yeah, really, that's it. Faith in Jesus has torn that barrier down between God and you. This is the new setup. Because we know that Jesus has been made the perfect sacrifice once and for all. The uncleanness that used to cling to us, that inundated every part of us, has been washed away in the blood of the Lamb. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Think about that for a moment. Can you recall a time prior to this where the disciples are recorded as saying a prayer that starts out, Dear Heavenly Father. Not until Jesus first gives them His own prayer as a precursor to what He's going to do for us on the cross, which begins with Our Father, because now we have this unique and amazing relationship with God as His children. Because on the cross, Christ took our relationship, separated unclean sinners, and gave us His own perfect sonship. So now we say, dear Heavenly Father. That's also why we conclude many of our prayers in the name of Jesus. Amen. So now ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. All right, we're rolling here. We're through three verses. You ready for more? But now you might be asking yourself, okay, 
That all makes sense, Pastor. I get what you're saying from the Scriptures. And I knew some of that, but now maybe I've got some new connections that I can put together. But what benefit is it to me? I've prayed before, and I, I prayed, as you said, even before you explained why all that was necessary. And sometimes it doesn't do anything. Sometimes it feels like God isn't listening. So I hear you when you say, ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. But sometimes when I pray, I don't receive what I ask for. And I'm not joyful about that. In fact, I'm sad and frustrated. And I don't feel like I'm even heard. Now, if I asked you what you meant, you might say that you prayed for something that didn't happen. The loved one that you prayed for desperately that still passed away. The surgery that didn't bring about full recovery. The job you didn't get. The prayers that your marriage would remain unbroken and your marriage didn't last. The list goes on and on. Prayers given faithfully, saying, Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, and yet it seems they go unheard. So why should I pray? What's in it for me? What good does it do me? Well, let's see what Jesus says to his disciples here. In verse 25, he starts saying that he's, going, he's been speaking in figures of speech, but the time is coming when that's going to end, and he's going to speak plainly. And he says something kind of interesting when you first read it. He says, I won't ask on your behalf with the Father. So I think some of us, myself included, sometimes think that what we do is we say the words and then Jesus takes those words and asks the Father in our stead. But that's not what happens. He says, I did not, I won't ask on your behalf with the Father. You can ask him directly because he loves you. And why does he love you? Because you had faith in me that I came from God. You believed in me. Now the disciples in, in classic disciple fashions, they're like, ah, okay, I get it now. You now are finally speaking plainly. But of course we know they don't fully understand what Jesus is talking about. Say, so you know all things. This is why we believe you came from God. And then Jesus responds with a rhetorical question, do you now believe? Which he does fairly often. And then he answers his own question. Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. Hmm. They don't fully understand what is to come. This is why Jesus is giving them these words now, and later on when they receive the Holy Spirit, He will bring them about in their remembrance. Because what's coming next, they don't understand. They don't foresee. See, the disciples, they had a plan for Jesus. But their plan was not God's plan. And Jesus knows they don't understand this and that there's going to be a time of sorrow, a time of loss, a time of confusion when he is going to do what needs to be done. Something is coming they do not understand. Does that sound familiar? Have you ever prayed about something that is looming in your life? And one of the themes of your prayers is that you don't understand why it's happening. That you, I know, Lord, that you're in this, but I don't know why. I can't see how. And we're desperate to get him to follow our rules and our plan. Just like the disciples were. Oh, we get it now. We know exactly what's coming we know what you're about, Jesus. And when Jesus starts to do what they don't expect, there's even moments where 
They try to say, Peter takes them aside, Jesus, I know what you said there, but I've got a better idea. Let me help you out. And what is Jesus' response to that correction? Get behind me, Satan. Because Jesus knows what's best, not just for his disciples, but for you and me. And sometimes what's best is beyond our ability to understand. Because God has greater vision and knowledge and power than we do. So we do this in our prayers too. We have a plan for how we want God to behave about the things we're asking for. As I illustrate with the kids, wouldn't it be great if he was like our divine Pez machine? God, I want this. Poof. And it's there. Do this for me, please. And I'm saying please be polite, but really I expect if you're really the loving God that you say you are, you'll do what I say. But imagine for a moment if Peter got his way. Imagine for a moment if Peter's plan was the one that happened and not God's. Today would be very different. There would still be a curtain around the altar. I'd still be killing cows and goats to make atonement for your sinfulness and my own. There would have been no sacrifice once and for all. But dear friends in Christ, there was. Because it isn't about our plan and our knowledge and our understanding, but it's about God's. And that is what prayer is about. That's the gift that it is, that you and I are somehow allowed into the throne room of God to make requests of Him, and in no world, even in our earthly realm, is a king required to do exactly what you ask of Him. But a good king, the best of kings, does even better for you than what you ask. And so it is with the disciples. They want Jesus to be an earthly ruler, to throw off the yoke of the Romans, to set things right in this world. But he has something far better in mind. And so he says, no, you will not keep me from the task my God has set me on, my heavenly Father. Because through that task, this barrier will be removed and you will be able to talk to the Father directly because he loves you. Because you have believed me that I came from God. And notice that after Jesus gives a sort of ominous pronouncement to his disciples, he almost does a complete 180 in the very next verse. He says, I have said these things that in me you may have peace. Right after he just tells them that there's going to be an hour coming soon where you're going to scatter and abandon me alone. I say these things so that you may have peace. What is he talking about? He's talking about when they receive the Holy Spirit. And they recall the lessons and the the words of Jesus in light of his resurrection. Because that changes everything. Jesus didn't stay dead. He rose from the dead. He appeared to his disciples. And after that, everything is different. Our relationship with God fundamentally changed in a far better way than we could have ever imagined. The barrier between us and God torn in two. And now you can say, Dear Heavenly Father, because He loves you, each and every one. So Jesus has prepared and is preparing us even today for the same tribulations, the same sort of tribulations this world has to offer us, right? That's what he says. Right after he says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. And that is the truth. You know it. There's unrest and sorrow, tragedy, turmoil, confusion, doubt, you name it. 
But Jesus has said these things to us so that we may have peace in the midst of our tribulation because Jesus is risen from the dead. He has accomplished the sacrifice once and for all, the barrier removed forever. I have said these things to you that you may have peace. And then he concludes with one of my favorite parts in the Scriptures. He doesn't diminish your sorrows, your tribulations. He doesn't pretend like they don't exist. But then he says this about them. But take heart, because I have overcome the world. Whatever the world has to throw at us in terms of tribulation is defeated at the cross, is no more in Jesus. It is gone forever. So, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, take heart, ask, address your heavenly Father because He loves you. For you have believed in Jesus that He came from God and what He has done for you. The giving of His blood, the washing away of all of your sins so that now you can be in the presence of God unafraid and make requests of Him. What a wondrous gift that is. So I thought instead of my normal conclusion, since we're talking about prayer, that we should probably conclude with a prayer. So please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, our Lord Jesus, your Son, has asked us to pray to you. He promises that you love us, and we believe him. Thank you for loving us. Sometimes, just like the disciples experienced during the passion of Jesus, this world hurts us. It brings us pain and sorrow. In those times, we ask for your comforting presence to be made clear to us, that you would bring us the only peace that passes the understanding of this world, the peace that our Lord Jesus made for us by being the sacrifice to atone for our sins once and for all, a peace that comes from the hope of the resurrection and our Lord's victory over all the sin this world can muster. In Jesus' name we ask all these things. Amen.